personal and personalization uh, in learning. Um, <clears throat> oops. Uh, so the title is uh, Personal and Personalized uh, Learning. What do we really mean by, this, by that? Uh, I am Ebosje Nilsson, uh, coming from Sweden. Uh, I have a long experience from Lund University, but also from several other universities in Sweden about uh, open online learning, e-learning, uh, MOOCs, OERs, you name it. I'm also an Eden Fellow. Eden is the European Network for Distance and Online Education. and also an Open Education uh, Fellow. Uh, and I have awarded those uh, titles as uh, we're quite a lot international within those areas. Uh, I'm also the Vice President of the Swedish Association for Distance Education. And I'm an e-learning quality expert. Uh, I work with the EIDTU, which is, which is the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities and also for ICDE, which is the International Council for Distance uh, educa Education. I work as a quality reviewer for e-learning and for MOOCs. And then nowadays I have also my own uh, consultancy you know, within those areas. I publish a lot and I uh, used to be keynote for several conferences, etc. And uh, this is uh, really one of my uh, hot spots uh, to talk about. Uh, uh, I think you as well as me uh, can't uh, hardly read any article nowadays uh, without the phrase personalized, personalized learning is mentioned and personalization and it has uh, been um, somewhat, some, somewhat some kind of a buzzword uh, nowadays I would say. Um, that's the reason why I have uh, started to myself reflect a lot about it, what, what do we really mean about it and uh, I have had a lot of uh, thoughts about it and I have written uh, quite a lot about it as well. Uh, and also rather recently, both um, Stephen Downs, who we all know, uh, he also used to take part to, to um, give speeches uh, in the Moodle MOOCs. Um, Stephen Downs, but also Martin Weller uh, from the UK, he is an OER um, UNESCO chair. Uh, they have very recently um, also discussed uh, those concepts uh, in their blog posts and in um, areas where they are involved in. And um, I very much uh, share um, their view because that is uh, what I used to, to, to talk about as well. So tonight, uh, for my presentation, I will take a rather large stance about what Stephen Downs is talking about, which also, uh, as I said, is my own reflections. Um, so, um, why is the, that discussed that much now, so, so much now, and why do we need to change education? First of all, um, the level of disengagement um, is very important, and um, many uh, learners, students, uh, pupils um, give a voice that um, education is rather boring nowadays because it's so uh, traditional and uh, um, not really motivating. So then you know, for that reason, you need to do something. And also that um, uh, the today's uh, world is so complex, and um, uh, what we need uh, today is uh, students and citizens uh, who are capable in different ways, and uh, not just by the subject or topic they have studied at universities or, or in schools, but also those so called uh, soft skills like entrepreneurship, like um, collaborating, like, like networking, like um, uh, adapt to new uh, environments, um, innovation, etc., etc. And those kind of soft skills are not that uh, rather easy to uh, always have in a curricula or to uh, have assessments on. But uh, those are the, the values which uh, not least uh, um, um, employers uh, are asking for. Uh, but also um, to meet future skills and needs and um, uh, get rec recognized, uh, we need students with different set of capabilities because uh, uh, not everyone can, uh, can do everything, but all together we can do a lot. And we can complement each other at working places, for example, with different uh, set of cap capabilities. 
Um, I think most of you know Ken Robinson. He is a very famous uh, TED talker. And um, he um, also says, say that uh, we need to uh, rethink uh, a lot about schooling. And um, he is calling for radical rethink of schools to, uh, to nurture creativity. And um, as I started to, to say that the, the levels of, the, uh, in, of disengagement is rather low in most uh, school settings uh, because there's not uh, room for creativity. And that is what uh, Ken Robinson is talking about. So there are a lot of rather um, seriously um, uh, things uh, why education need to change and why we need to talk about personal learning, maybe not so much about personalization, and I would talk more about the differences between those. Um, there are other um, issues as well uh, for the need of change because we are all collaborators. Nowadays it's not that uh, teachers are better or no more than the pupils, but um, we all together know different kind of things. And uh, Professor Hati, um, who's an education professor, he, he reminds us that the biggest effects of students' learning occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching and when students become their own teachers. Uh, so in um, other words, there are needs for rethinking a lot of roles uh, and attitudes for the students and for the teachers. And it's also everyone who, who have um, been in a teaching situation or a learning situation know that when you explain things for others, then you learn a lot yourself as well. Um, so what if young people design their own learning? What will happen? And how can we uh, emphasize and facilitate that? Uh, think of what, what with the Lego. The Lego. Um, I'm sure all of, all of you have... Uh, have built with uh, those Legos, um, or your grandchildren, or your children, or and it's amazing because uh, with Legos you can really uh, develop your creativity, and you can do more or less uh, everything uh, in your own path and it, with your own passion uh, and with your own interest. And um, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of ways, or millions of ways, I would rather say. Uh, of different ways how you can put those um, bricks together and it's rather amazing and it's also start a lot of creativity so what's happened if we compare building with Lego bricks um, for the school system for the pupils for the students instead of having those uh, in your or silos uh, curriculums sure if we, we start to, to, if the students or the learners take the command or in the driving seat of the learners, then they will take more responsibilities as well. And there will be amazing things coming up when you are doing uh, things you like, but due to inner motivation. Um, so personal versus personalization. Does it matter how, how we phrase it? Yes, I will argue that. Uh, as I said also in the, in the beginning, personalization is some kind of buzzword nowadays, and everyone says, oh, our curricula, our school, our university, we, we are working with personalization. Yes, that is very fine in many ways. But... <laughs> Uh, as uh, Stephen Downs also is saying, we hear the phrase personalized learning a lot, really a lot. Uh, so much that it has begun to lose its meaning. And if you check uh, what it really means, Wikipedia tells us that it's the tailoring of pedagogy, curriculum and learning environments by learners or for learners in order to meet their different learning needs and aspirations.
Um, and he, he continued to say that even this uh, short definition provides us with several dimensions across which personalization may be defined. And each of these has been the subject of considerable debate in the field. Pedagogy. Uh, do we need to differentiate the instruction according to students' uh, learning styles? Or is that all a big myth? The curricula. Should the students study the same subject in the same order, beginning with the foundational subjects, such, <coughs> such as the understanding, for example, reading or mathematics, or can it be a variation in order for different students? Uh, most uh, school settings are um, they are started from, from number from the beginning and then all have to do do it in the same kind of way, same kind of line. Um, and maybe there are some kind of personalization uh, within uh, this uh, linear organization. But maybe not. Uh, about learning environments, should students work in groups in a collaborative classroom or can they learn by their own uh, at home uh, with social um, media, with uh, social networks uh, and online, of course. Um, in personalized learning today, the idea is to enable technology to make many of the, these decisions for us. Uh, for example, adaptive learning entails the presentation of different course content based on a student's prior experience or performance in learning tasks. Um, with all those uh, approaches, um, they have in common that started all from the offers from the school system, from the university or from the school. Um, so he, he, Stephen does uh, further say that uh, the question is whether we should apply those methods or not. And he, he argued for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, individual vari variability over overweights uh, statistical significance. Um, and he compared it with uh, the doctor and, and, uh, and the medicine. Does the, does the medicine work in the same way for all kind of people? Or is it based on individual uh, circumstances? And the second, it shouldn't be, he said that it shouldn't be up to the education system to determine what the person learns, how they learn, and where they learn. That is an individual choice. Uh, he wants to say that um, the case of personal learning, if we are talking about that, the role of the educational system is not to provide learning, but it is to support learning. And personal learning uh, often begins informally by motiv intrinsic motivation or by um, passion or maybe some kind of need to, to learn something. And it is internally driven. Uh, that is why it is uh, uh, more efficient and also more fun, because learning needs to be fun. Um, to work uh, by personal learning instead of personalization, because personalization is more tailor-made by the institution. Uh, mm. The school or the university. Uh, learning is a mean to an end and not the end itself. That is also why assessment are uh, one of the reasons why, why um, there are failures with assessment, especially in online learning, 
uh, it is that the assessment is the goal, not the, the process as such. Um, he compared to say, Steve Adams, he compared to say that personalized learning is like being served at a restaurant. And I, I used, actually, before I saw his blog post about this, I used to have this kind of um, images uh, myself when I do presentations about uh, this topic. So it was just uh, um, like a, to, to more or less reading my own, uh, my own uh, presentations of my, my papers. Uh, as I say, that uh, personalized learning is like being served as a rest at a restaurant. It is someone who has selected the food and preparing the food, and there is some kind of menu. Uh, and yes, you can choose what you like. And if we are some friends going out for, for dinner, for example, yes, we can choose different kind of food, different kind of dishes, depending on our taste and depending on our if we have allergies, or cetera, or special kind of taste. <laughs> and we can uh, can uh, customize it, and we can uh, tailor it for to suit our own uh, needs and demands and uh, taste. And you can sometimes also tell the waiter how you will have the meat cooked, for example. But uh, essentially, um, more or less, everyone at the restaurant gets the same kind of experience. And that is. Um, different from personal learning which is more like to go to a shopping or a grocery store or like this one in Barcelona, the La Boqueria, which is one of the most lovely um, marketplaces I have ever been in. So if you go to Barcelona in Spain, in Spain please go there. Um, so personal learning is more like a, to go to a grocery store um, you need to assemble a lot of ingredients yourself, and you need to create your own meals, and you <clears throat> need to choose what you like. Of course, it's harder in many ways. Um, it is cheaper, and you can also do an endless variation of the of the products you have you have bought. And you got also a lot of experience uh, during the way. Uh, doing it by yourself. And you also have a, a, both inner and a outer control of what you're buying, buying and what you're cooking. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so go to a restaurant or go to a, a shopping mall or, <coughs> or a, a grocery store. It's a big difference. And also, uh, if people are to become effective learners, they need to be able to learn on their own. And it's said that you can learn anything, and that's also the, um, <clears throat> the sentence which the Khan Academy are using. You can learn anything. Um, and it's also said that uh, we never learn uh, about talking. We learn things when we are asking questions. So that is also why personal learning um, need to be more emphasized, uh, because you learn when you have an interest, when you ask the questions, which serves you. <coughs> um, people learn or, and are effective learners, and they, if they know how to learn. I saw someone who was, which was written in the chat, um, you can learn anything, everywhere, anywhere, by anyone, <coughs> by uh, any device, uh, anyhow. And that is also what, for example, here in Europe, the European Commission has stated when they talk about opening up education. As education and learning are available, learning possibilities are available all over the places uh, to internet. Um, seven days a week, 24 hours uh, a day, and uh, all around the year. Uh, you need how to uh, digest uh, and, and take the, the information you, you, you need. If, and you can do that if you know how. 
And in this way, they can also um, make personal uh, learning possibilities to uh, building their own curriculum and to also forge their own learning path. And in this way, um, learners will not all, uh, all, only rely on education provider, provi providers. <coughs> uh, um, let me see. Um, there can also be um, similarities about, uh, and Stephen Down is, is also talking about that, that personalized le learning, which is more tailor, uh, tailor orientated, is like uh, going on a charter travel. Yes, the whole group of tourists uh, are going for a charter by bus or flight, for example, <laughs> as I used uh, those images. <coughs> Of course, they have their own um, um, their own um, demands, their own wish wishes. Why they go to place, and they have their own experiences, of course. But um, the difference is that uh, they are more taken the whole group uh, on the same route. And that is different from uh, being a. Uh, a learner on personal learning and promote that. That is more like a backpacker. <laughs> a backpacker uh, bring their own things with them and choose what they, if they like and where to go. Um, so learning is personal. With personal learning, you do for yourself. With personalized learning, someone is doing it for you. And that makes a big difference in uh, motivation, in passion, in deep learning, in uh, outcomes, uh, whatever you, you name it. Uh, personalized learning is also more about uh, uh, correction about content and content and practice and about corrections and about requirements uh, while personal learning uh, as <clears throat> what you do for your, yourself is about uh, practice and about content and about iteration and affordance uh, it's really a different um, uh, a different uh, approach to, to learning this image is um, from Stephen Downs. Uh, he had a presentation at the Education Technology Summit. It was just uh, a month ago. Maybe some of you have, um, have seen it before. Um, also, Dave, Dave Cormier, who was the, the person and the man who coined the concept MOOC. Uh, when Stephen Downs and um, George Stevens uh, started with, all, with his, uh, those with their courses, and he said that uh, the society is the curricula, and if we can, if we use the society as the curricula, and with personal learning, uh, we are all uh, better learners, and uh, we are all doing uh, better for our own life and for society and for employment. And that is also what employers are asking for, those kind of more soft skills, which uh, belong to the society. Uh, Dave Cormier had a, a MOOC, uh, I think it was last year, uh, I followed it myself. It was called the uh, Rise of 14, uh, two years ago, sorry. Uh, it was called the Rise of 14. And the Rise of it's been, it's, uh, the, the concept of a right zone, that <coughs> learning it more takes a right zone uh, path than a linear path. There are connections like a, like a rhizome, like a root threads in plants. And the questions um, uh, one has to ask is, uh, what, could, what could a success look like for me in this learning situation? So those are questions learner uh, in 
uh, when the society is the curricula uh, have to ask. Another question is, what does it mean to being to this community? What do they value? Do I value those, those things? Um, <clears throat> the third question is uh, about who are the people that are the concept that I can carry me forward? In what way am I this for someone else? Those are rather um, easy questions in many ways, but also very, very difficult. And from those uh, three uh, simple questions, they come a lot uh, out from that, how you can form your own uh, curricula and your own uh, learning uh, goals. Um, so I mentioned with rhizomatic learning, which are those threads which have connections in many different kind of, of ways. Um, it is a difference if you have uh, the perspective of personal learning or personalized uh, learning. Uh, personalized learning uh, is more like this kind of linear or pipeline uh, learning. Yes, you can make uh, different kind of experiences, but you have all to start from one place and go into, you know, the, the different kind of steps, the different kind of levels in the curricula, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and you start at one one place and you end in another way, other place, and all in the class, all in the group, or starting at the same place, ending in the same place, <laughs> and more or less at the same time. While a rhizomatic um, approach more have really the, uh, um, the personal style, uh, personal learning style, uh, personal path uh, due to motivation, due to needs, uh, due to demands from, from and by yourself. So why it is important to um, to reflect on those concepts and what the consequences uh, are. Uh, it has uh, importance because of, we are talking so much about 21st century skills, which is very much about to read, write, and connect, uh, to learn about learning, reflecting, and sharing, uh, to do, teach, and watch, to present, document, and disseminate. And uh, both uh, school children, but also um, learners at universities, need more to um, uh, to train to to train those 20th century skills. And again, those are the kind of skills which are uh, demanding in the society and by the employers. Not so much uh, the fact as such, because in fact you can always you can always learn. You can al always updated check it. Of course you need to have some kind of uh, foundation that is, I mean, I, I really don't not neglect that because that is very, very, very important. But you need so much more in a learning setting. <clears throat> um, here are uh, another way to express the 21st century skills. Um, uh, it's about critical thinking, about communication, about collaboration, and creativity. And I mentioned in the beginning uh, um, Ken Robinson, who are talking so much about that schools and educational settings are killing creativity uh, the way it is um, by the traditional way. Um, again, another uh, image about 21st century skills. It is about uh, competencies, what I can do. It is about attributes, who I am. It is about experience, what I have done. About knowledge, what I know. And the talking uh, related to that, that again to personal versus personalization. Uh, those 21st century skills are more easy to develop and to um, um, nourish uh, when you have a personal uh, learning approach. Um, 
And personal, personal learning in practice, uh, it is very much about some of those questions which I have raised uh, earlier on as well, about identity, who I am, how do I fit in the community, what are my principles and values, what are my goals, uh, about um, growth and reflection, uh, what evidence demonstration my growth uh, as a student, citizen and community members, how can I achieve my goals, what habits of mine uh, are helping me to succeed, how am I changing, how do I address my strengths and challenges, uh, about growth mind mindset and brain development. And third, uh, about transformation. Why am I ready for the next step? How have I transformed to succeed in my next learning life stage? So those questions, if we raise those questions um, on daily basis in learning settings, uh, we, um, we are more approaching um, the personal learning in practice uh, approach. Uh, taking the stance from the individual's uh, demands, needs, wishes. Um, and also, uh, the single learner can make her or his own uh, personal learning plan about, uh, for example, identifying goals, about understanding uh, uh, capabilities, about exploring and develop goals. Uh, developing strategies to achieve the goals, uh, selecting and developing at least one cap capability, uh, interaction with others to refine the goals, and reflecting on the learning. And again, um, if you have this approach um, in learning settings, uh, there are possibilities to um, uh, facilitate uh, personal learning and instead of the offers the institutions or the schools are given and tailor that with personalization and that is a huge difference if you really take the stance from the individual. Um, Again, uh, there are so many ways of um, looking at 21st century skills and uh, I think we have already covered uh, most of um, the headings from, from uh, on this image. Um, maybe not so much about uh, analytical thinking and problem solving. So that can be a be adding, added, sorry. Um, so with personal learning, uh, learners also develop their own personal learning environment. And that is very much, as we all know, uh, to uh, social media nowadays. And those personal learning environments look different uh, due to de depending uh, different uh, uh, individuals' uh, network, their needs, uh, their uh, maturity, um, each uh, their, their uh, educational goals. That is also uh, what is important to not just uh, in, in learning settings say that we shall have a Facebook group, we shall have the blogs, uh, because each individual has their own uh, learning style which need to be nourishing. And that is of course because uh, <coughs> all the, those uh, issues have consequences for personal development and learning is about personal development. Uh, there are needs to get uh, self-awareness, to get self-knowledge, identity, uh, to know uh, one's talents and potentials and one's aspirations and one dr one's dreams. And of course, as we all know, again, those are different for di from different uh, human beings. And if um, human beings and learners can get those um, uh, 
dimensions, um, fulfill those dimensions in their learning settings, then they also grow as a, a person and get personal development. <clears throat> so teachers um, have a key role on how to cultivate uh, learning and how to cultivate um, personal learning. That is the reason why the feedbacks uh, with students and teachers and with peers are so important for, uh, for further learning. As one of the slides in, in, in the beginning was about, um, we all have some have roles in, uh, in our learning settings. Uh, teachers are sometimes learners and learners are sometimes teachers. And there need to be more, but much more uh, collaboration. Uh, so, what are the challenges uh, challenges uh, ahead? Of course, there are large challenges uh, as um, education is more and more uh, unbundling. Education takes place in so many different kind of settings, and uh, not everything uh, takes place in house in a school or in a university. There are also challenges uh, with the leadership. Um, it is another kind of leadership uh, and, and also another kind of management in, a digital, uh, uh, di in digital working places, which need to be focused much more on than uh, it, it is. And the research show quite well that um, sometimes leaders are the barriers for development on an enhancement for increased digitalization. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, rethink and reshape and re <laughs> for almost everything. And uh, of course there are challenges with globalization. We, we need today to be more uh, both uh, local but also uh, international and look at it in the global settings. But um, mainly uh, the largest uh, uh, challenge uh, taking the approach of personal learning instead of personaliz personalization is to let the learners orchestra their own learning. Um, one of the key uh, quality uh, issues uh, in open online learning is about ownership. If learners have ownership for their own learning, uh, People, human beings, are capable to learn almost anything, everywhere, from anyone, at any time. So let the learners take the lead. So it was a pleasure to share my thoughts about personal and personalization with you tonight. Um, maybe you have some questions here in the chat or... <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Eba. I think that this topic is um, is very, very important uh, to all of us. There are some um, comments that I, I think you might want to relate to, and that's from Dirk. He says that um, he is skeptical. He doesn't believe people are able to either direct or regulate their own learning experiences. When you don't know what you need to know, it's very hard to direct your own learning in the proper direction and regulate that process. Uh, can you um, clarify um, how to um, help students, support them, um, so that they can uh, direct and regulate their own learning? Um, yes, um, I mean, I, I see this uh, coming, uh, comment uh, on, on in the chat. Um, yes, of course, um, it is always a balance, first of all. Um, I mean, uh, it also depends, um, uh, depends the level of um, 
in schools or at university, of course, where, where you are. Uh, it depends, uh, I mean, uh, on a lot, read on a lot of things. But uh, I will argue that, um, um, I mean, my main point was about that it is a difference if you have a personalization to, that you just target, uh, that you just um, uh, tailor, ta sorry, tailor um, uh within the offers, within the service, within the content you, you are providing. That it, the, the difference is that it is the university, the school who offers. That is one, and then you can personalize within those kind of um, frame. Or if you take the, really the other approach that you start with a, from the learner's perspective and the learner's uh, needs, uh, demands, uh, wishes, uh, uh, etc. Um, but I think also that um, You can, you can, um, I mean, you can do it in different kind of ways. You, you may, sometimes you maybe need to have some kind of knowledge foundation and some to, to build on. To, to, you need to have your, your subject, you need to have your knowledge. Uh, that is not what I'm saying. I'm not neglected that, uh, that it didn't importance at all. <laughs> uh, but you can start with the, with the questions people have uh, before you are delivering your speech about the topic or about uh, how to understand mathematics, for example. You can start with the questions people have about mathematics. I mean, you can do it to what is simple sometimes. You don't need to do, to change maybe every, everything at one, one time. Um, so I have no, I have really no solution, but I think uh, uh, one solution is the approach you take uh, to let the learners take the lead. And that can make a difference. Then you can build it step by step. There's another question. There are two other questions. One question is, how do you evaluate? Uh, that's from Indira. Indira asks, are there any tools for checking quality of online learning? Um, yes, for quality for online learning, um, there are many models, I would say. Uh, that is one of my other uh, uh, research speciality about the quality in open online learning. And again, there is not just one model which fits uh, all and which fits uh, everyone. First of all, we have different uh, stakeholders in open online learning. Uh, it also depends on maturity for an organization with open online learning and uh, but, uh, I mean, for the stakeholders, we have the learner, we have the teachers, we have the institution, we have the um, legal authority for, for the universities or for the school, the school authority, and they have different kind of demands for quality. And then, of course, we have a quality on micro level, like, like in, in the subject or in the curricula or and in the meso level in the school and at the macro level at the nation, for example. So there is not just uh, one model which uh, fits all, uh, but actually I myself did a study by for ICD last year, um, together with some colleagues, um, and it was a research study. We looked at uh, over 40 quality models around the around the globe, from uh, every continent, about quality in open online learning, OER, and MOOCs, and um, basically uh, for all those models. Uh, we found a rather s large similarities. It is imp first of all, it's important to have a holistic approach, uh, and that means that uh, you need to have um, a management, a strategy, an infrastructure. You need to look at the curricula, how it is, uh, the content of the curricula, how it is delivered, and you need to look at the support for students and for staff. But I uh, think, and I will say also talking about assessments, that um, those um, assess, uh, examinations and assessments are often made uh, on content and not so much about, uh, for example, the 21st century skills, which are so important. And uh, also rather, I mean, we, we take for granted that uh, students and pupils just uh, shall do it, but they don't get the credits for it. 
And I think that's not fair. We need to, to value all the hard work uh, they are doing. Not at least, for example, to, to manage uh, internet and social media and networking and collaboration and all those kind of things. We need to acknowledge it. So, some other questions? Yeah, I see another question from Helena. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Helena. Um, after. Helena, the online. Oh, there's another one. No, it wasn't Helena. Indira, how do we know that online learning is actually effective and... I think that's the last question. No, there should be another one. Um, do they accept? Uh, yeah, do we accept? Yes, do we accept online learning? Do they accept? What do students think? Do they accept online uh, learning? Who, who are they? Do they accept online learning? I think it's students. students. Or maybe teachers, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, is the question about if students accept online learning? Was that the question? Yes, it's students. That's what Helena says. Helena's asked the question about students. Um, was the question uh, if students accept online learning? Question. Exactly, yes. Um, of course, it, again, it is generalized, but I think um, uh, mostly and mainly um, students uh, demand uh, online learning as that is the way um, information is uh, provided and uh, a collaboration is uh, possible. I mean, we are living in, a, in an e-society uh, in most countries at least. Um, so, so why shouldn't uh, school, school settings and the school environment and learning environment be any society? <laughs> but I think also that uh, teachers, um, I would more say that um, not, all, not all teachers accept it, but uh, there are large demands from learners uh, because that is the way, I mean, that is their daily, their, their daily life. And uh, for those um, in, in your courses, uh, Nelly, there has been a lot discussed during the years about the native, uh, digital, digital natives and um, uh, digital skills, etc., etc., and the importance of that. I mean, we are living in an e-society with increased digitalization. So, so education must also follow that. Or not just follow, be in the forefront, I would say. Because uh, education is for the future. And that is also why the European Commission, for example, here in Europe, have uh, really taken uh, a lot of steps for uh, and initiatives and spent a lot of money about increased um, digitalization, to not least to be competitive, uh, both in Europe but also in, on the globe, both in, uh, in education but also for... Uh, for society. I think there may, there may be a question of um, policy. It's, generally, it's a um, uh, top-down policy, whether they, uh, the um, organization, uh, whether it's higher education, colleges and universities, whether they offer blended or fully online courses it's the students have nothing to do with it they either take the courses or they don't or sometimes they don't have, even have a choice um yes uh, yes that is true i mean that is also one way where we need to also rethink a lot because what is um I think universities started at least to the MOOCs uh, or due to the MOOCs and open education resources, uh, which also is in my in my scope. Um, and I used to have presentations about that otherwise. Uh, I mean, 
when <coughs> MOOCs are, are here to stay and that really um, transform uh, the way universities um, uh, are working and what they can offer and what they can serve. So I think universities also need to rethink um, how they are organized, not least to this unbundling uh, approach, but also to what kind of offers they have. Um, they offer a lot of courses which no one are asking for. Maybe they should uh, be more collaborative with uh, the society, uh, also at the global uh, level. Uh, what are the needs for education? I mean, that is one of the reasons why MOOCs are so popular, because they have filled the gap, which are not uh, the universities are offering this kind of, of uh, learning possibilities at this kind of courses. That's true. I think the love for learning uh, is there. It's just that it may not be um, directed the way yeah. it should from, you know, top down. Yes, and I think, um, I, I mean, totally there need to be top down uh, strategies, but there need also to be bottom up uh, strategies. And not at least, um, uh, I talked about leadership. Leadership at all levels uh, are very important to also embrace digital. Uh, what kind of demands there are for digital uh, organizations, because there are different kind of, of demands for that. Are there any other questions? Um, I think that's it. Anyways, you've raised, uh, I, I enjoy your talk so much, um, Eva, because you know, you get us thinking, and I think that's that's what we love to do most. <laughs> you know, all of us <laughs> love to think. Yes, yes. Um, and and I think that this <laughs> this should be encouraged in school. Yes, and too. I think um, you know, get our students. I think uh, also that I mean, we can't change everything in one night, but all of us can do small steps, and all together we can really make uh, things uh, happening and uh, things uh, get the things changed. And also, especially as we are thinking, if we are really are thinking about what what does it really mean with personal? I mean, in this case, what does it really mean by personalization? Is it the same as personal, or is it something else? It is, in my opinion, it is something else. But as I said in the beginning, personalization has become some kind of buzzword, and it is often written in strategies, but no one understands really what it is about and how you can facilitate it. So thank you very much, all of you who have attended, and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you for another great uh, session. And I'm glad the technology <laughs> yes. was on our side today. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Bye. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we've got a session if uh, you're interested. Um, but you're welcome to join us. Yes, um, yes, I would try to, to, to join. Of a Moodle course. So. All right, I'll send the good link. I'm going to send everyone a long link because uh, the WizIQ links seem to be problematic these days. Bye. All right, so thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.